Well, hello, boys and girls. Here we are at When We Feel Like It O'Clock, and uh, we have one of the finest in the land here. I'm telling you, this is going to be the first time you saw him, but it shouldn't be, because he's fantastic. It's Joe Boric. He, uh, he's part of the Nitty Gritty podcast. Check it out on the YouTube. You also have YouTube. You put it on YouTube, but it's mostly through podcasts, right? Uh, yeah, the Flyers Nitty Gritty, we uh, put it on YouTube. It's also on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. That's where I normally catch it at, but I believe we're also on other podcasts where you can find your podcast as well, normal podcast holders. But that would be more of a question for uh, the great Jamie Baskow at the Flyers Nitty Gritty because I mainly use Apple and Spotify. But I know we're on all those bigger platforms and then – my good buddy Andrews and I's uh, podcast I do with True Philadelphians uh, Sportcast, as people can tell, I have a pretty Philadelphia Eastern Coast U.S. voice, um, is also on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify as well as YouTube as an audio file. But on YouTube, it's under my YouTube channel, Sports Fanatic News, spelled with a P, like the Phillies Fanatic, um, to uh, – exemplify that and that's what our podcast is under and then i have a chase in the pennant to get my baseball itch out uh that i do with uh my baseball friends so i stay pretty busy but that's beautiful because we're in quarantine we're in a time where we're not able to do much outside so staying pretty busy inside is a beautiful thing yeah and you mentioned jamie basco he is great He's a great human. He's amazing. Great, great yeah. writer, great everybody. You got to check him out out there. He's got a Twitter at Jamie Basco. And uh, he has kind of rejuvenated me to think that uh, and, and kind of picked me out to do a couple of videos with and then introduced me to these fine people here. And they are extremely, extremely good at what they do. You got to check it out. But today, yesterday, I did some individual uh, videos and I. I kind of looked at the West uh, uh, and and the, how the teams would be affected by uh, or impacted by getting Lafreniere if they lost. But what I want to do today is I want to look at some predictions for the playoffs, both West and East, and we'll also see what you where, where you think the the impact would be if uh, and what your thoughts are on the whole idea that. One of these teams is going to get the first overall pick. I mean, that's pretty cray cray uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then we'll look at the, and then we'll look at the East. I haven't really delved into the East and how that will be. And I was going to do an individual video, but I thought, why not bring two minds into this? Well, at least yours, anyways. Mind, who knows? <laughs> and see how, and see how it turns out. So, um, first, I guess, uh, what do you think about? the fact how they did all this draft lottery thing you think it was effective or could there have been a better way or well i know ej uh, raddick the one announcer who was on nhl network it was post the draft lottery and he brought up the flyers jumped from 13 to 2 when they picked patrick other teams jumped from 15 in the top three before and he brought up a bunch of different examples where it wasn't likely to happen, but also obviously when you added up the percentages, because it was all the bottom eight out, it, there kind of was a decent chance when you added them up of a field team rather than the other eight getting the top pick because, well, when you added up the percentages, it was higher than the others. It's just when you looked at the individual per E, F, like all those teams they are out it wasn't a high percentage but when you added it all together you were like oh, there's a decent chance of these teams getting the pick but the bigger point was even by the one total teams jump up a lot and it was shocking to me but once uh he came out with it i was thinking maybe the third or second overall pick when he said they had a uh, seven cards instead of eight would go to a team that was in the play-in. But then when he said the first, I'm like, okay, this changes up the entire night. And it did. Because Alexis Lafreniere was scheduled to interview with multiple different outlets that I was excited to watch post-draft. And he interviewed with zero of them because he has no idea where he's going. So what's the point of him getting on and talking about, well, I could go to one of these 16 teams, uh, 
I like this one team for this reason. I like this other t-. Like, you're not going to do that as a prospect, so... He's not uh, going to say that anyways, but yeah. Yeah, you're not going to say that anyways, but... That would uh, be funny if a prospect... That would be, that would be hilarious if they did it. As long it. I'm as I don't go to the Montreal Canadiens on Slack. I'm surprised how much some guys opened up to Gretzky, because when he had guys like Drysdale and Sanderson and uh, Stutzel and Lafreniere on, some of them, other than Lafreniere, kind of answered who their favorite team was growing up and said, oh, well, it would be awesome to play for them if that could happen, where Lafreniere was the only one that actually gave the normal kind of NHL or future NHL or answer of whoever I get drafted by, I'll be happy with. So I was kind of, but but that's also because it's freaking Green Gretzky. Green Gretzky can also get most people probably in hockey to open up a little bit more probably. than yeah, that presence in itself. But, I mean, I, I thought it was fine. I, I, I'm not going to bicker over it because I think the commissioner and uh, the Players Association did such a good job. This is the standpoint I come from, getting us back in a safe return to play now. Now we're down to four cities that could be announced today, and if not today, sometime near soon, of what four cities between Chicago, Vegas, and then Toronto and Edmonton, where you're at, of course, in Alberta, uh, was a place that that it could be, which um, I think that's something I give them a lot of credit for. I give them a lot of credit. It seems like the CBA extension is going to be announced soon. So even if this was like some people saw it, a quote unquote screw up by the league to allow the team in the front in the play in to get it. It's one thing in a scheme of Gary Bettman's one big Achilles heel has been CBAs. If he was able to get a CBA extension in a pandemic and a one Ach- on top of return to play and a one Achilles heel is a team in the field of the play in gets the first pick. I'm okay with that because I would much rather have all the other things. Yeah. 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 I'm with you on that. I, I, I thought they did fine. I mean, I didn't put much thought into a better way to tell you yeah. the honest truth. I probably could, but it doesn't really matter. And it, it, I just find it exciting. Now. It's, yeah, it's going to make it nuts now. It yeah. almost seemed like it was like, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but if anything was fixed, this would be something that would seem like it was fixed, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's just a fluke that worked out in their favor. So let's go look at the West. I already did some on the West, but I'll put in my two bits. Why not? Let's start off with Edmonton, Chicago. Who are you looking for there? Well, the only chance I would have thought – now, I do think this will be a closer series than some people think because you got the experience of Seabrooks, Keys. Obviously, you got Kaner, you got Tate. You got all the experience with Chicago. But Edmonton's got McDavid, and then you got Dreisaitl, who's likely going to win the Hart Trophy. Um, you got Larson, who's a pretty good defenseman. It's just he's not well-liked because he was traded – well, not well-liked by people that love Taylor Hall, of course, because you guys – didn't make the most even ended trade there, but oh, a bad trade, yeah. yeah, but he, he's still a pretty solid defenseman in Good his own. Top four, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you got cliff bomb, et cetera. You guys are going to win that series. In my opinion, I just think it'll be closer and it would have been a chance to be a three to two series if they kept Robin Leonard. Now that they don't have him and Malcolm Subban struggled to get going. I like the kid, but I think he's just a goalie. That's not going to be like that takes longer. And in his mid to later 20s is one of those guys that really hits it. So Crawford's really going to have to step up for them. I see them losing that since it's a best of five, three to one. But those games are going to be very close because Chicago has so much experience where Edmonton does not. So, Uh, Yeah, yeah, I I agree. And I I said basically the exact same thing. So uh, Nashville, Arizona. Nashville, Arizona, I mean, that's a tough one for me. I think Nashville's going to win, but I love Rick. I mean, Rick Tockett's a former fly, former post-game analyst, too. Love the guy. Um, great great guy as well. A uh, guy that was tough uh, as well when he played in his days. Another guy you probably don't want to mess with too much. Um, but they're a team that's going to be tough because you got Ronta and Kemper, who could have, of course, if he stayed healthy, been a contention for the Vezina. So, it's just Pecorine is a beast of a goalie, one of the best of our last decade, obviously. And you got UC Soros. So those two guys combined with Yossi, who could potentially win the Norris. He's right up there with Carlson. 
I think they'll win the series, but I think that one's going to be a 3-2. I do not think Nashville's winning that series by a large margin at all. I think that's going to be a battle, and that's going to be a 3-2 um, series win for Nashville by a slim margin. Might even be an overtime game. Yeah, I, I, uh, I had that as a coin flip as well. Um, but I actually had Arizona pulling it out with Kemper. Well, I, in there. And I don't even know why. I couldn't explain <laughs> it. It's just simply because Kemper can win that series. And it's going to be a defensive battle. And Arizona is a better defensive team. That's the only That's, reason why. I, I kind of hope you're right, though. Because like I said, I love Rick Tockett. And it's not, like, it's not like Lavi's with the Predators anymore. So I don't have as much of a affection for them as I used to. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so Vancouver, Minnesota series. Uh, Vancouver, obviously the Canucks are a team. When you look at them on paper, you would think they could be a little bit higher than a seven in the water team that I think a lot of us counted out coming into this season due to Parise's injury history. Uh, obviously Parise stepped up a lot this year. They're a team with Devin Dubnik, another great big body goaltender. That's going to be another hell of a series. And I think it's really going to depend on how the young kids of Vancouver can step up in their first real playoff run. Because if they're, if they're not able to step up, obviously, again, Minnesota's got guys that have been in the playoffs, been there, done that over Vancouver. I would probably lean towards that series to be potentially one of the upsets in the play-in round and have, I think the Wild will win probably by one game because Jacob Markstrom, again, is another good hell of a goaltender. He could steal you one game that makes it a 3-2 series instead of a 3-1. to one. I just think this is going to be a great growing year where you talk about building blocks for the Canucks to get their young players in there and in the play, and then they're going to be pissed off next year, and that's when they're really going to take off. So I think the Wild will upset them in this year, though. So far, we're bang on, but I had Minnesota, too, uh, for much the same reasons you did. I just like the way Dean Evison had that team going into the round, and now they're going to have be rested with those veterans like Stahl, and uh, I, I, I think it gives Minnesota the lean a little bit in that regard. So uh, the next one's very interesting, and I have a feeling we're going to be four for four here. Calgary, Winnipeg, what do you figure? And then um, was the next one uh, Calgary and the Jets? Calgary and the Jets, yeah. Calgary and okay, Winnipeg. cool. Um, yeah, Calgary and the Jets. The Jets are, I mean, you talk about a team that really relied on their goaltending. Uh, talk about a team that piggybacked off of their goaltender, carried them on his back. Connor Hellbuck was a man on a mission this year to get the Jets to where they're at. If he stays that man on a mission, yeah, maybe they could beat Calgary. The problem is Cam Talbot stepped up this year for Calgary uh, time and time again when Riddish was struggling, and then Riddish was kind of able to get going again. Calgary has skill throughout the lineup. Winnipeg is a struggling defense other than their top pair. The only way I see Winnipeg winning that series is mainly because Cam Talbot decides to become this, the – saving grace of their team that's just a brick wall that can't be stopped but i'm gonna find that hard with the pressure that calgary can supply with hannafin goudreau and all the boys they got over there i mean i think between their defensemen that can move the puck up the ice to johnny hockey to multitudes of other guys on that team they got too much skill to play with the struggling developing defense of the jets i just can't see I, I just can't see it uh, happening for the Jets this year unless if um, Hellbuck comes in and plays like the Vezina candidate. He wasn't even better than that because, again, the playoffs are a different beast. It moves a million times faster. I, I see them losing that series. I, I think we're going to have a lot of close series this year, but I could see the Flames actually making that 3-1, to one, just even though it's an 8-9, and nine, just because – Again, unless if Pionk and Morrissey really are able to rally the rest of their defensemen, the Jets have not been good throughout their defense this year. Uh, well, yeah, they haven't been, but I, there, there's where this is one where we disagree, and I got Winnipeg winning this one. Uh, for the reasons you mentioned, I believe Hollaback will win it over. They've been doing, he's been doing it all year. 
Uh, I agree with Winnipeg's defense is, is not very good, for sure. No doubt about that. Uh, their offense is certainly strong enough to make up for it. And I just am not a fan of Calgary's team. Uh, it's uh, It could go either way. I would not be surprised if Calgary won it, for sure. But if you tie me down and make me pick a team, I'm going to go with Winnipeg. I just think that uh, the Hellebuck will keep them in enough that their offense can take over, and Calgary's offense has been sputtering all year. Ward seemed to be turning things around, though, uh, when he took over there in Calgary, mm-hmm. and uh, you just you just never know. Uh, he, he could win. Now, out of these, out of all the teams in the West, I'm going to do it this way because I already did a video on it for time purposes. Where, which team do you, would you think would be best for Lafreniere to go to? Well, in terms of best for him to become a, the guy that everyone loves and he becomes a saving grace, obviously if Arizona gets the first overall pick, he can become the saving grace of that. People are going to travel 45 minutes, 55 minutes, two hours People will travel out of the Arizona city once they realize what they have in Alexis Lafreniere. They'll travel to that stadium down there. They're not going to care about that at that point, even though they have a couple cats on their team like Clayton Keller. I think they shouldn't care about that right now, but that's not here nor there. Um, But the the other team for me, that would be the one that would work the best for him because I think he's that good of a player. He's going to be the guy that has the chance to be the next dynamic guy like Crosby, like some people put him up to be. So going to Arizona, they really need that guy to help bring more market share and help build up the revenue of that team. I just think that would be perfect for the NHL and perfect for him if he's, if Arizona is able to get him with the first pick. Now, in terms of the most ridiculous, the most ridiculous would be where you're at, Edmonton. If you had Leon Dreisaitl, Alexis Lafreniere, and, and Connor McDavid all suiting up for the same team, that would be absolutely nuts. That'd be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I love Edmonton. It's my team. Uh, Philly in the East, obviously, is my team as well. But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I almost am bashful if they win this. Like, I'm almost apologetic, like... Uh, he sort of handed it to us. It almost feels like we didn't even try. <laughs> like we got Dre, got McDavid, and then Nugent Hopkins. We won that in the draft, and and uh, then all of that just handed over to us. But I mean, it'd be fantastic. Yeah, I I said basically the same thing. For the league's purposes, Arizona for sure. They need to go. He would need to go. Like it would be as. It's almost a need for Arizona. They are hanging on by a thread. They need somebody like that in that organization. So um, we'll get deeper into that because you can go check out on my uh, my previous video I did where I talked about each team and how it would impact them. One thing I didn't talk about, I forgot about Minnesota Wild. Let me tell you, if Minnesota Wild got Lafreniere, that could almost not save that franchise, but save them a rebuild of about two years. So it would be fantastic for them as well. Okay, now we get into the serious stuff here, buddy. We're going to both go out of here because no, because uh, I, I, um, the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Montreal Canadiens first, I think we'll probably agree on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. The only, uh, the only way the Canadians are beating Pittsburgh is if Carey Price plays like circa Carey Price a couple of years back, which he's still playing good by his peers. He got voted on as the best goaltender but that's by his peers and we know peers can be a little biased at times um but he's still a hell of a goalie but he's not single-handedly carrying if he does that's one of the best feats i'm going to see in the history of the postseason if carry price beats pittsburgh that's going to be talked about probably 40 years from now if the canadians win that series because that's how good carry price is going to have to do so i see i see them stealing because of carry price one game i don't think they'll get swept but it'll be a three to one series i got him i got him being swept and uh so th- with that in mind oh we were going to say what would happen what would be the impact if uh pittsburgh or montreal got lafreniere well first of all the odds of pittsburgh getting them is so incredibly thin because it's just so unlikely that they're going to win. But if they did happen to get him, it'd be sick. It'd make me sick to my stomach, really. It would. (laughs) 
That would be two. That would be worse than uh, – because at least uh, you guys up there in Edmonton, you guys have good fillers in your line. But you have Yamamoto, but beyond that, you just have good depth fillers in your lineup that work well for your team. Pittsburgh has a more filled-out roster. If they added Lafoniere to that, that's just not even fair at a certain point. Well, it just makes it so, you know, it's, they're always on the precipice. Are they going to have to rebuild this year, this year, this year? And if they got Lafreniere, there's, oh, they yeah. don't have to rebuild. Like, they always seem to find that, though, because they yeah. found get, Gensel emerged for them where they thought, oh, maybe we'll have to uh, retool a little bit. And then Jake Gensel started coming on as hot as a fire. I'm like, oh, never mind. We don't have to retool at all. Jake Gensel's here. Um, yeah. So if they get Lafreniere and they have Gensel continuing to develop, that's going to be nuts. That's a big reason why they're going to be uh, ridiculous in the playoffs because Gensel hopes he's going to be able to play uh, skating with the team again. And if he's able to go, that's a huge game changer for Pittsburgh to have in the playoff. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so Montreal Canadiens getting Lafreniere, that would be like... That would be a, that would be a biggest game. I mean, you, Domi's your main offensive spark guy i love one of my favorite players in the league i love watching because of his toughness and grittiness as a smaller player that can score as gallagher but he none of those two guys are guys you can use as your top catalyst of your team but Ale- alexis lafreniere obviously is and if you have those guys already in-house for you to mix in perfect with him uh, though that's a team that I think would work out perfect. You already have the goaltending. Harry Price is still very good. So that's a great building block piece for expediting your rebuild in tenfold for Montreal because that that's something as long as they're able to pick up a few more defensemen around some of their youngsters that they have to keep building up like Mete, uh, that will really help them to be able to cement their redevelopment process because Suzuki's been great for them since they got him. So they're they're building that development process a little bit quicker already. If they get Lafreniere, they might already be competing for a wild card spot next year outside of this expanded uh, format. Yeah, I know I've talked to people in Montreal and they actually like would rather it not happen because they want Bergevin Ben gone. They're sick of them and they're sick of that whole management team. And they think that if they got left for a year, it would just make them a good enough team to make the playoffs. <laughs> and they'd never be able to get over that hump and they might have a point. But I and that would, actually is a very good point. Yeah, that's, that's and that is a very that is a very good point. It's almost the worst team it could go to, but it would be his team. He's from the you know, it's a French Canadian yeah. going to Montreal. So it's a weird Especially if be he became an all time great there. Uh that's the thing. In the end, if Alexis Lafreniere becomes what we think he's gonna become, even though the management can be shaky in Montreal, uh that that might just fix itself with how good he freaking is because eventually you see with players that get so good they have a say eventually a little bit when it's like oh see this guy in the free agent pool he seems like a guy that might make sense to us eventually you have a little bit Lafreniere is going to be a guy that's going to have so much of an impact on your team I think you're going to forget about it after time with how well he does uh, and he's not going to settle for oh, let's just keep signing people to higher expense contract instead of maybe getting somebody that would make more sense that we would just have to develop a little bit more. He's not going to put up for that, just like Jack Eichel's not putting up for that in Buffalo. But obviously wow. Montreal's in a lot better of a situation than Buffalo. But Lafreniere, you're going to have a lot less. I think you'll have three, four years if you can't figure it out. He's not. He's going to be so good of a player. He's not going to be a guy who's just going to sit there and say, uh, "You can't get a good defense in front of Carey Price." Uh, I'm just. I'm just going to chill here until I'm 28 to figure out how to have a good career and have a successful win rate. No, he's going to be like, "Yeah, you guys better uh, move this along here because uh, we have a good team with a few great players here. You just need to put it together." Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah. Um... It would be an interesting dynamic, that's for sure. So let's go to our next series. Then we got uh, Carolina and New York Rangers. What do you got there? That one again. Um, that one. Um, that one's gonna depend how much a young goaltender steps up. I know when me and you were talking on the phone, we kind of talked about Shostor- Shosturkin a little bit. Um, 
where Mrazek obviously doesn't have the experience at all uh, in, as much in the play. He's played a little bit, but he played decent for the Red Wings the one year. But other than that, he's only been decent in the playoffs. He's a guy. And then you have Hank. Uh, with the Rangers, who if Shesterkin's not able to get going, you never know. The playoffs are different. He had a lot of time off. Uh, Lundqvist has all the experience in the world. Maybe he's able to um, strike lightning in a bottle and pull something out for you. So that's going to be a very tight series. Um, looking at the numbers, uh, and I looked at them more last night after we had a phone call, I do think the Rangers have a good chance in this one because if Shesterkin can play like he did and come in and play really well, and even if he doesn't, your fallback plan is a Hall of Famer. So your whole, your fallback plan is a Hall of Famer that has been maybe struggle in the past couple of years, but we do know in the postseason can be a difference maker. So And he's had a lot of time off. I think these older goaltenders that struggled a bit, this law period for guys like Lundqvist and Flurry. They're the guys that are going to benefit the most by it because they're going to be able to say, hey, I had a down year as a veteran. I'm Let me watch this tape. Let me watch all this. And when I come back, if my name's called upon, I'm going to make sure that I'm ready and willing to strike and be the guy that they expect me to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I would have... say the Rangers three to two. That's going to be a tight. So Rob Brindam was a very good head coach. He knows how to coach that Carolina team. Just like uh, Quinn knows how to coach that Rangers team, I think that's going to make that a 3-2 series, regardless of the goaltending, because Brendan Moore just seems like, as a newer head coach, he can win with anybody you throw within the pipes at this point. So, uh, Well, we'll see. That, we'll yeah. see if I don't know Moore about is... in the postseason, but in the regular season. We'll see. I don't think uh, Carolina has become the team yet that they can become – and uh, I just, I, I just, this, I can't get Shesterkin out of my head. That kid is insane. He's one of the, <laughs> we'll see if he can keep it up. But so far, it's been nuts. And yeah, I take the New York Rangers as well. Yeah. So let's say Carolina gets Lafreniere. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, that's another massive game changer for them because you got, you also got Carolina would actually be a pretty good fit because you got the great mix of great youngsters down there. Then you got the because you got Jordan Stahl. Then you got the Svechnikovs uh, down there as the youngsters. You got the Stahls as the veterans. You have perfect guys to teach and mentor him along as well as the great skilled players to put him on a line with already. And you have, like I said, I love Brenda Moore as a head coach. It seems like he's very good at being able to – help guys along as well. Their issue is just consistency at times on both sides with Carolina. Obviously, getting a player like Lafayette, well, that's going to fix your consistency issues pretty damn quickly. So um, that's a guy that's going to bring in a uh, huge, huge impact, probably one of the biggest impacts to a team like Carolina, especially if they get a guy like we were talking before this podcast, like Leonard as a goalie. Well, phew, with Lafayette and a goalie like him, yeah, you're a team that's right up there in a cup contention. Uh, sure. Reimer, I think, has another year on his contract, so you probably keep him as your backup. Uh, that's a pretty solid backup who played yeah. pretty well this year. So you got a uh, good stuff going. There. They they got a good team. They got a good depth team filled out too. Warren Fogel's a player I like. Uh, Martinook, McGinn, etc. They have a filled out roster. Yeah, they just need to be able to – Williams is a perfect player, as we know, to have in the playoffs. They just need to be able to have other guys step up, like Trocek, Edmondson at a down year, Gardner. Those guys have to be able to step up for them. Their thing is getting that one more veteran stay-at-home guy, I think, in their um, field at defense might help a little bit because they do have a lot of youngsters like Peche, Hamilton, Shea, Slavin. Getting that one um, stay-at-home veteran, I think, might really help to solidify that group. Um, maybe not even a guy that plays a lot, just a guy that would be great for the young core. Um, well, I mean, if that's all you need. That, if they get yeah. from here, that team is a cup contender every year for the next mm -hmm. couple of years. That team is going to be insane. Uh, Ajo, having Ajo, uh, Lafreniere, uh, Lafreniere, and because they have a good defense on paper, 
Svechnikov yeah. next yeah. year is going to yeah. score almost probably. I wouldn't doubt if he scores forty goals next year. Like that is how good I think that guy oh. is. Yeah, and he then knows. you put in the guy like Lafreniere and on top of it, like wow, wow, what a great lineup that would be. New York Rangers, I don't even want to talk about it. If they get, <laughs> if they lose to Cal, if they lose to Carolina and get Lafreniere, I am going to be so upset. If there's any team that doesn't deserve to get somebody handed to them like that, like they already did with Kako, the team that can pick up any college kid they want, I don't know. Uh, it's jealousy, no doubt about it. I'm going to tell you right off the bat. I'm totally jealous of the New York Rangers. I don't hate them. It just pisses me off. They have so many <laughs> advantages. They they got all the money. Everybody wants to go there. And, uh, and it's, it's New York. It's like and it's then like, they get handed caco on top of yeah. it. Like, Jesus. It's like the old song says, New York. New yeah. York. It's like Sinatra said. It's New York. It's the bright lights of New York. I mean, everybody. You can make it there. You can make every, it anywhere. Yeah, everybody uh, loves it. Everybody doesn't love their owner, but everybody loves um, New York. Gene, uh, the same guy that owns the Knicks is an owning partner that doesn't. Thank God. He's not, for them, he's not involved in the hockey operations like the Bagulas are, but uh, he's not the best owner. <laughs> um, but he's a guy, but they're a team. They play in a historic arena which obviously helps them to draw people to them playing in the madison square garden is a huge draw and i think that fan base i as a flyers fan do not want to see this in a million years of capo caco panarin um and then you have tough guys mixed in i know how much you like him as a player in a uh, lemieux who knows yes. how to uh, hit and score that. and yeah. stuff like that uh zabenajad had his best year this year I mean, the list goes on and on with that team. Howden's just getting going in his career. So, I mean, adding a – that just wouldn't – yeah, that, that just seems like it fell into their lap, and that That's would just, just be ridiculous not for fair. Flyers fans. Not uh, I, I would not – I would not – yeah, I would not like to I see I do not play. want that to happen. As a New Philly York fan, pitch, as a yeah. Philly fan, that's the last place I want That's to why I hope New York actually does, even though I normally would never cheer for a rival. This is why as Flyers fans – we have to cheer technically for Pittsburgh and New York in the play-in round well, they don't get because we don't want them to have any chance of getting the first overall pick. Out yeah. of all the teams in the East, I don't want them to go New York is the most. At least with Carolina, they're going to become cup contenders immediately, but they've never won a cup, and it's great for the league for a team like Carolina to do really well, so I don't mind it a bit. So we go on to the New York Islanders Florida series. Where are you looking at there? That's a very interesting series because the Panthers are the just a team that is inexplicable some years. They have good rosters. They just don't have the fan base. They're a team that you would think has a chance to do a little bit better. Of course, this year, Bobrovsky had a huge impact in how far they were able to go because he had his uh, least mm -hmm. effective year in the league this season. And again, as a veteran, um, Bob's somebody that, does need to tone it down sometime, but I think he's a guy, he might say, again, look, I kind of sucked at times this year. I need to be able to come in for the playoffs and step up uh, because he had some good overall stats in the end, but when you watched him at times in stretch runs, uh, those saves that were routine for Bobrovsky this year in Florida, especially at the beginning of the season, um, he wasn't able to make those until he kind of started getting comfortable, it seemed, before we wrapped up and locked everything down. So I think for him, he's going to have to, and he's a guy I, I love, so it's tough saying that as a Flyers fan, that he stunk at times this year, but he's going to have to step up. And I think he's a guy that has the ability to do it. But with, with coached by Barry Trotz, the Islanders, I don't think he's beating that Islanders team. They're coached by one of the a guy that knows how to get as much as he can out of his guys. For Lamoff's a goalie that stepped up for teams in the past. And then Tomas Grice, you have as a great 1A option if uh, for Lamoff's not able to step up. So because of how great that team is coached on Long Island, well, now it's not always on Long Island, but sometimes on Long Island. Um, I think that they will win that series. It'll be a, I think they're actually win that series three to one just because of the struggles of Florida this year. They're just too inconsistent of a team 
for me to bank on. I love the play. I love Huberdo. I love Barkov. I love a bunch of select players on that team. Their defense is just so inconsistent as well. And Bob, when he was able to stand on his head for Columbus in past years through inconsistent defenses, hasn't necessarily been able to do the same at times this year. So. Well, I think Bob Rowski was propped up quite a bit by Tortorella's system, made him look very good. I think he's a good goaltender. He's a great goaltender, but he's got to tone, like you said, tone it down a notch. He's got to humble himself. Somebody's got to humble that guy. He got uh, he's somewhere along the line. He seemed to get ahead about him, then giving him ten million dollars on top of it. He's yelling at his defense team. He's he's being very difficult in the room. It was in Columbus, and it seems to be going on in Florida. And uh, this could be a that contract could be the end of Florida. It's as simple as that, and for sure. An Islanders team that I said in the beginning of the year, if they made the playoffs, Trots should win coach of the year simply because that lineup really shouldn't be making the playoffs <laughs> at all but uh no. and by the end of the year he was using too many guys that hadn't played that much in the league and they were getting tired but now they're going to be rested and ready to go in a trot system that can destroy teams even without having lots of talent i agree with you i think the islanders will win now was it all I was going to say, wasn't Ger- I'm trying to remember what team he was on, but I know um, the short, quick guy, Nathan Gerby, got called up by some contending team. Columbus. That was Columbus. Yeah, I know, yeah. because they're, they're another team that had a lot of injuries this yeah. year. I know it was a team that got bit by the uh Which we'll get into in some the aspects. next yeah. series for sure. But uh, Lafreniere, um, going to the island would do – absolute enormous things for that organization because they are in trouble right now. Uh, they're one of those middling organizations that can't, that can't seem to add the player they need. If they could have got Panarin, they were trying to get Panarin, but uh, they need to add to that lineup to get some offense and uh, even some defense. They've got a very average or, uh, system and it's going to be hard to, to make it not average. So it would be huge. Florida, I almost don't want personally want Lafreniere to go there because it's just a disaster there. And I, I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to see a career ruined because of going to a team that ha- the ownership has said they want to stop spending. And that tells you something right there. I think the Florida is on, on their way out. I agree. I think Florida is a team that's bound to be uh, moved at a certain point whenever that time comes to a different location. Um, So I don't think that's a good setting for him at all. I do think the Islanders uh, will be that will be a perfect match made in heaven for them if they were to find a way to lose to Florida because and win the first because you got a lot of high cap hits with lods of the world. You paid Josh Bailey maybe a little bit more than you needed to. Same with Anders Lee. The list goes on. So in order to get a player of that magnitude into the island, it's probably going to have to be through the draft because you're not going to want to just keep adding on to your cap hits by trying to get guys like, oh, well, Tyler Toffoli stays in the free agency. He can put the puck in the net. Let's overpay Tyler Toffoli. It's like, well, that's not the best strategy to continue overpaying people so they come to you to think you could make them pretty good still. So I think for them, because of cap and the way they kind of been running their business like that, that would be a match made in heaven for them because they won't have to do that anymore because because of overpaying some of those guys, their stats will probably start paying or paying, playing to those contracts rather when they have a guy like Lafreniere around them. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind the contract for Bailey. I don't mind the contract for this. But the problem is they have too many guys that are two-way players that can't score. And you know what? That's, that's kind of what uh, Lamorell is known for is building teams like yeah. that. And well, then they, they went also got another guy that's just like that in Pajot. I didn't <laughs> like that move at all. Uh, the biggest know. guy they overpaid though was Boychuk because Boychuk was an aging uh, yeah. defenseman. Yeah, they didn't have to give him that money they gave him. So that's what I was kind of him and Andrew Lott uh, having him in your uh, organization. I I really liked the player uh, back in the day. Uh, I know he played for the Jets, and I think Lott was one of those guys that also played for the Flash Thrashers when they were still the Thrashers, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, going uh, back Chicago, that way. and Chicago. Chicago yeah, right going Chicago. back. So um, he's a guy that just unfortunately fell out quicker than you would have liked to see in his career. But 
he gets paid like he's still was playing three or four years ago. So that uh, he was getting, he was injured when he signed that contract. And uh, from what I understand, most people knew it and it was a big gamble because they lost Duck Pozo, right? Uh, yeah. Cause they lost with, him, which is great that they didn't sign him, but they put the money in bad money. Anyways, I was Gar Snow making those moves and he made a lot of bad ones, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, New York, I think New York Islanders would win, but I almost think it would be better for the Islanders if they lost and took the chance of getting the friend here. Uh, now the next one. I think we might may disagree here, uh, but uh, Toronto, Columbus. Um, my one friend, this is a uh, tough one for me too because my one friend is a Blue Jackets fan, so obviously if I pick Toronto and he listens to this podcast that might not go too swimmingly. Um, I I think Columbus depends. They're getting their guys back from injury. They're coached by Torch. It's just for me also, Toronto's a top. The, the thing that concerns me is you're a top two lines heavy, like I was talking about before the podcast, but they're also a team because of how talented those top two lines are, you think should have been ranked higher than an eighth seed on paper, uh, where – they just never have been able to fully hit where they should hit each year. So if they're able, they're a team that scares me in a sense of if they're able to kind of live up to what people think they could do, then they're a team that could win the play in. And then with Anderson as a goalie, I know how much you also love Muzzin as a great stay at home guy, along with the rest of their squad they got there, they'll be able to kind of pull it together and rally with, the rest like Matthews, Mourner, and really get going. That's what scares me with them. But because it hasn't been seen, I think when I looked in more into it, Corpy obviously was doing really solid when he went out. And I didn't honestly realize in some a- certain aspects how well he was doing. So that made me like you lean a little bit more towards, I think it's going to be a 3-2 series. I don't think this series is going to be 3-1 by any stretch. But a leaning more towards in a tight battle, Columbus might win because Mers Lincoln stepped up. Tortorella is a great coach. And obviously, Corpusawa, I just didn't, I knew he was great before he went down. I just didn't realize in certain aspects how good some of his stats were. So from looking at that, because uh, the guy, I mean, the, the guy when he went down, he didn't have the highest save percentage, but I mean, the dude did have, I remember from looking at it, four first stars and he had two shutouts. So, you know, he stepped up time and time again for the team. And then Merz Lincoln's, I mean, there's there's a, there's so much you can say about him. He came in, played lights out, went above a 920 save percentage, had, I think it was five shutouts as a guy that came out of nowhere. Like, what more do you want to say? So when I look more into the numbers, I had to go with, I think we actually agree on this now. I had to go with wow. Columbus because you made me. It's because of you. Uh, you made me uh, last night after our phone call. I was like, you know, he might be right. Let me look more into these goalie numbers. And if you ask Jamie, or I think uh, sometimes you might call him Jamo or something. If you ask him, uh, he's a guy that will tell you how much I love goaltending. So I looked into oh, the awesome. numbers and went, um, yeah, you know what? No, I got to go with this group of goaltenders over just Frederick Anderson. Uh, because of the inconsistency of the Maple Leafs not being able to step up and have scoring throughout their lineup. You obviously need that in the playoffs. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's, there's not much rhyme or reason to it. Tortorella just has, is an absolute genius in getting his teams to do exactly what needs to be done and knowing exactly what needs to be done. And all year I watched Toronto. I did not see a team that, uh, was a that seemed to be able to adapt. They have a I, their yeah, defense is super poor. I think it's worse than Winnipeg's. Uh, and I don't think Anderson is as good of a goaltender as Hullabuck. And I think it's one. Of, there's other teams that they could have played, like Florida or something like that, where I probably would have picked Toronto. But Columbus plays the kind of game that their system of play gets destroyed by and i just i don't i think if they especially if they lose the first game it could be a sweep that's how much i think columbus is going to win this so that being said got to finish up here lafreniere to toronto and lafreniere to columbus 
Um, I think, I mean, Columbus, it would be ridiculous because you could pair him if you wanted to. Dubois as your center, you could put him with uh, him as your winger and that playmaking ability of Pierre-Luc Dubois with Alexis Lafreniere on a line could be a ridiculous line for many years to come. But like I said with Toronto, that's another thing that would almost be a match made in heaven for them because they don't have balanced scoring. Uh, Lafreniere is not a guy you want to play on your third scratch line. So you're going to move somebody on your top two line down to your third um, scratching and gnawing scoring, but also gritty line. And that's going to build your scoring better throughout your lineup. So I think Toronto is actually a team that might benefit the most from getting Alexis Lafreniere because you don't have you you don't have that balance. You have your top two lines. And then you have very inconsistencies. Your best guy below your top two lines is Kerfoot, who I like as a player, but obviously is not a points accumulator and is just a solid third line center for you. So that's why I think they might be one of the teams that benefit the most from him. He's an impact player that can kind of counterbalance a struggling defense at times, too. It's not like uh, when we saw. Now, obviously, they came back down to earth in past years, but when we saw you guys in Edmonton doing good before this year, before you would come back down to earth in certain seasons, it was normally off of the backs of how great McDavid was doing, how great Dreisaitl was continuing to improve. If your defense was struggling, some great stars can counterbalance that for a period of time with how good your offense is doing. The Maple Leafs might have a chance to get that type of offense to counterbalance their defense until they can match it with their offense if they get Lafreniere, because then you could add three lines that could actually score and not two, which is a huge difference. So, I think if they got Lafreniere, they're forced to trade somebody for defense. Absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, they're just not going to be able to sign him anyways. Uh, they would have to trade somebody for defense anyways. It would make it easier for them to do that, and it would actually would probably – force them to do that finally because that's exactly what they need to do um i i before they signed Tavares, i said it was a bad move i didn't like it i didn't like and i love Tavares. There's nothing against Tavares. it's just you already just had cap. matthews you already had matthews you could have just kept cadre and you know built your team in a way that you have to in a cap world i honestly don't know what they were thinking it just seems yeah. like the toronto maple leafs can find a way to do silly stuff no matter who you put in there. No matter what minds you put together, they're going to do silly stuff to shoot themselves in the foot. And to me, signing Tavares was one of those things. I did not like it. But uh, uh, getting Lafreniere would force them to trade somebody and probably correct that. So it might not be a bad move. Uh, Columbus, I think they deserve it. They went for it. Uh, Getting Lafreniere would be great for the fan base, great the team they went for it at a time when uh everybody was saying not to and uh kekalainen is a genius general manager who is rebuilding this team on the fly and it'd be great for them that being said like i said i think columbus will win and we won't even have this discussion but tr- toronto wins it might be the best thing that could happen to them just for the fact that they'd actually have to trade somebody to get balance in their life yeah now, out of their uh, top guys, though, if they trade for a higher cap, because obviously guys like the Hymans of the world and Kasperi Kapanen, who have been rumored, don't have the biggest money hit. Uh, I would think, I don't think they're going to trade Mourner, and I don't think they're going to trade Matthew. So that would leave uh, William. Um, Nylander, yeah. I-, I could see them trading Nylander potentially in a good deal to bring in defense. So yeah. that that would be the guy I would look to. Um, probably is the guy to move because he has a bigger, I think, six something, if I remember correctly, cap uh, hit. Um, six, so, six, seven, five, I believe. Six, seven, five. Okay, some, yeah, high sixes. So that's a guy I could see them moving because they're not going to move the other two, in my opinion. And Tavares, they're not going to move because that's just too hard of a trade for any team to be able to figure out how to do, probably, except for a select few team. He's got NTC all the heck, no trade clause. Yeah, he also has the no trade got, clause, so he would he would have to go. He's got promises that he'll never trade. I'm like they they threw everything at him to get him over there. I, I didn't like it. It's unfortunate. It's probably going to be their downfall. 
in the long run anyways. I was actually even saying before they signed Marner to trade him, and I love Marner. I would hate to trade Marner, but getting Tavares almost forced your hand to do so, and now they're seeing why uh, because they just don't have the balance in, the lo- balance in their lineup. Anyways, Blends, wow, this has been fantastic. And uh, Joe, we will have you back for sure. We might even do a podcast with the three of us, Steele, Joe, and me. We're thinking about that. We're talking about all sorts of scenarios. So the frolic is going to be endless, boys and girls. Make sure you're heading over and watching that podcast, the Flyers Nitty Gritty podcast. It's fantastic. You will enjoy it, I promise you. And uh, keep on the edge of your seats for this fine programming because we're going to have a heck of a lot more coming your way. Thanks for coming, Joe. Thanks for being on. It was really special having you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and I just want to wish everybody well. We have hockey come back soon. It is now, what, the 30th or whatever, the 31st of the 30th of June. Hard to keep track of dates during the quarantine. Uh, June 10th, the track date, and then the end of July, beginning of August to start. So we're moving in the right direction. So as they say here in Philadelphia, I hope everybody's ready for some hockey, or are you ready for some hockey? Because we're moving in the – right directions and as uh as uh, pirlo said um we want to check out flyers nitty gritty and then the true philadelphian sports cast i do with my good buddy and then if anybody also likes baseball in here i do a chasing the panic podcast with my good friend as well and i love doing all those like i said you got to stay busy in these times stay positive and well everybody it was a joy uh, to be on here i would love to come on whenever you would like me to be on again anytime you want bud See you later, everybody. Lots of love to you. Peace.